I hope that you all had a very inspiring Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread and that we learned uh, lasting lessons during God's festivals. Here in Charlotte, uh, for those of you around the world, we're enjoying the beautiful Carolina spring with cherry blossoms all over the place, uh, lining the street of uh, the Crown Center Drive where God's headquarters is. Just very beautiful here. But there are parts of the world that are not beautiful. According to a United Nations report, 18,000 children will die every day or are dying every day from hunger and malnutrition. And in addition to that, uh, the UN reports that 850 million people will go to bed tonight with empty stomachs. Now, we do need to count our blessings, as we heard in the children's song. It tells us in Philippians 4.18, Philippians 2.14, and do all things without murmurings and complainings, certainly illustrated by the carnal Israelites on their exodus out of Egypt, which we rehearsed. Millions of others are oppressed and enslaved, and we thank God that he's freed us from slavery to sin. And we thank God that he told us to go forward in faith as we overcome daily. Our lives are very short. We God has given us a lifetime. For some of us, it's short. For some of us, we think it's long. But it tells us in James, the fourth chapter, if you'll turn there, what our life is like and how we count time. James, the fourth chapter, verse 14. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, breaking in the middle of the thought of those who say, oh, tomorrow I'll go here and tomorrow I'll go there, just just totally unaware of the vagaries and the vulnerabilities of life without God. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? James 4, verse 14. It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good, and does not do it to him, it is sin. Another one of the definitions of sin. What is your life? It's just a vapor. It appears today and is gone tomorrow. Turn to Psalm 90. Again, another comment, very insightful comment on our approach and philosophy and approach to life. Psalm 90, starting with verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years. And of course, many of us live longer than that. We have church members that are 99, and Mayola Wilson up in uh, Bluefield, uh, West Virginia, uh, will be 100 on uh, May 6th, I believe it is. The days of our lives are 70 years, and by reason of strength, they are 80 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. Verse 12, instruction for us. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We need to number our days. Perhaps you've asked yourself the same question. You've asked your question about your life. What are my goals in life. What, after I've lived a full life, what do I want as a summary of my life? What will I have accomplished? Or what will have God accomplished th through me? What if you were told you had only six months to live? Several of our church members have had to face that question when told they were dying of cancer or other causes. Their last thoughts have typically been, and one was just telling my wife this morning, my life is in God's hands. Is that your commitment? Is that your faith? And of course, we know in Hebrews 11:13 that these all died in faith, not having received the promises. So those who have died in the faith are in God's hands, and we look forward to the resurrection. But what about your life? Is your life even right now in God's hands? Think about that question throughout the sermon. 
I want to briefly tell you the story about United States Air Flight number 1549. Let me just ask you, how many of you have ever flown either from Charlotte to New York or New York to Charlotte? How many have flown and taken that flight? Okay, it's hard to see your hands, but it does look about like about 42% of you have taken that flight. U.S. Flight 1549 was going from LaGuardia Airport to the Charlotte International Airport. I saw a video earlier this year titled Brace for Impact that visualized or that summarized that flight. It was on the Discovery Channel. It was on January 15, 2009 that flight, U.S. Air Flight number 1549 was scheduled to fly from LaGuardia Airport, New York to the Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Some of you know the story that just three minutes into that flight, the airplane hit a flock of Canadian geese and both engines became powerless. The air traffic controllers tried to guide the pilot across, this was flying over the Hudson River, tried to guide the pilot to land in New Jersey, but he didn't have enough elevation, didn't have enough uh, time to do that, so he had to try to ditch or land in the Hudson River. In the Discovery Channel television program, Captain Sullenberger, also called Sully, and has also been acclaimed as a hero for his part in saving 150 passengers in that flight. In that video, he retraced the flight. So you're in the cockpit with him as he retraces that for the documentary. And he described moment by moment his attempt to land the plane in the Hudson River. He commented that the, plane, the, the wings of the plane had to be exactly level because if one just dipped into the water, the airplane would catapult and break apart and everyone would be killed. The title of the video was called Brace for Impact. And he told everyone, brace for impact just as they were about to hit the water. It was very moving to me to see some of the passengers interviewed. Uh, one man said, I was going to die. I know in 90 seconds I'm going to die. That was his thought. And another woman said she knew that she had just two minutes of life remaining. And she said, she prayed to God, God, forgive all my sins. I don't have time to confess them all. Please take care of my family. But well, what would be your thoughts if you had two minutes to live, six months to live? Would you think of your brethren here in Charlotte, your church family? Most passengers were thinking they were going to die. Captain Chelsea B. Sullenberger brought the plane down on the Hudson River. The air temperature was 20 degrees. The water, was in the, the water temperature was about 35 degrees. And the passengers had to evacuate onto rubber life rafts. And some of them had to stand, as you remember that classic picture, standing on the wings. And as the plane began to sink, they were standing in freezing water, and yet they had to stand there for minutes. But all 150 passengers were rescued as boats came around, and the event was later called Miracle on the Hudson. If you do a, an online search for Brace for Impact, uh, you can see a short excerpts from that video. To me, it was very emotionally uh, moving to see these people in emotionally themselves, recounting their last thoughts before impact. But they were saved, they didn't die. The Passover and the days of all them bread challenged us to think more deeply about our lives. And I hope we thought more about our mission as a church, our relationship with our Father in heaven and with our Savior, Jesus Christ. The point I want to emphasize in the sermon today, brethren, is that God has called us to be members of his family, his divine family, to be active Philadelphian members, that we are seeking the kingdom of God above all else, and we're preaching the gospel of the kingdom as a witness to the world, and feeding the flock, and warning the Israelite nations of the coming great tribulation. Are we fulfilling the purpose of our calling? Are we fulfilling the purpose of our lives? Are we truly committed to live God's way of life? Did we count the cost at baptism? Now, we read this several times during the Passover season, but let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. 
1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, because the principle is that of our part in God's plan of salvation. The world just thinks, well, accept Jesus, his sacrifice, all your sins are forgiven, and you're saved. That's all. There's nothing else you need to do. But it tells us here in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 5, Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. That is, they were unleavened physically, not spiritually, because they had the immorality, the puffed, they were puffed up even with that immorality, as it mentions in verse 2. For indeed, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Yes, there is a New Testament Passover. Therefore, let us keep the feast, the New Testament command, to a Gentile church, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, and malice and wickedness symbolic of our human nature, that self-deception we heard about in the sermonette, but the, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The profound principle for the days of unleavened bread shows the next step in God's plan of salvation of coming out of sin, getting Egypt or sin out of our lives, and to become overcomers. And the world doesn't know that. It doesn't even apply the second step in God's plan of salvation. But we have a calling to replace human nature with divine nature. It means that we must grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, 2 Peter 3, verse 18. That we must be overcomers. How can we overcome? Well, we know that we partake of the bread, unleavened bread, during the days of unleavened bread. We thought of the unleavened bread of life, that is, Jesus Christ. When he said, this is my body broken for you. And he's also the bread from heaven, the living bread from heaven. But his, that body was broken for our emotional and physical healing. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10, scripture that some of us read during the Passover itself. 1 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? So we all partook of wine during the Passover. The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? But notice that we are one bread in one body. Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 10. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So, brethren, we are combined. We are members of one another. We are members of the body of Christ. Let's turn to Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans 12, we see that connection that we have towards one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of his body, as a part of the bread, that one bread. And Christ is the living bread from heaven. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Romans, the 12th chapter, and starting uh, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, Romans 12, verse 5, So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we're not only members of the body of Christ, but we are members of one another. And our calling, of course, is to be a holy nation, a holy priesthood, as it tells us in 1 Peter 2, verses 5 and 9. Let's turn to Ephesians 5, verse 29. One more scripture showing our connection, our relationship to one another as part of the body of Christ. Ephesians 5, starting with verse 29. And this, of course, is in the section of husbands and wives' responsibilities. Ephesians 5, 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. And that, of course, is saying husbands... Nourish and cherish your wife, just as the Lord does the church. And that should be comforting and encouraging, realizing that the Lord does nourish and comfort the church and cherishes it. Verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his flesh and of his bones. It says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The title of the sermon today is Members 
of his body. We are members of his body. We're God's family, we're God's royal priesthood, we're his holy nation. And of course, we look forward to the next part in the plan of salvation through Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Fruits, now that we've celebrated Passover in the days of unleavened bread. But we want to focus on our calling and our identity. Who are we? We are the ecclesia, the called out ones of God. Turn uh, back there to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, as we heard in the sermonette and even in the commentary. We need to love one another as that body, members of one another, members of the very body of Christ. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, starting with uh, verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being mem many are one body, so also is Christ, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, for in fact the body is not one member, but many. We'll come back to that later. But we are joined to Christ through God's Holy Spirit. We're joined to God the Father through the Holy Spirit. But we want to be healthy members of that body. How can we be healthy members of that body? We've discussed those steps, but we reinforce it. We preach every Sabbath uh, to take heed, to listen, to rebuke, to reprove, to exhort one another while it is called today. Because today is our day of salvation, and we want to grow spiritually. But how can we be spiritually healthy? I mentioned this before, but just by way of review, on January 26, 2013, uh, Dr. Meredith gave the sermon on who will God protect, and he challenged us to examine ourselves in four major areas of our lives, Sabbath observance, tithes and offerings, judging and condemning, and respect for the ministry and remaining humble. And then on his sermon February 16th, which was a must play that was played in all of the churches March 16th in preparation for the Passover, that sermon was titled Passover Preparation, and Dr. Meredith exhorted us all to examine ourselves with each of the Ten Commandments, with respect to each of the Ten Commandments, and I hope you've, you've done that. We need to honestly reflect not only our keeping of the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law as well. So how can we be healthy members of Christ's body? In the remainder of the sermon, I want to give you seven keys to being healthy, spiritually healthy members of God's body. Number one is to pray for one another. Let's turn back to James, the fifth chapter. James, the fifth chapter. You know that scripture by heart. Verse 16. James 4, verse 16. James 5, verse 16, sorry. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You know the stories of those who had been anointed for healing and then were focusing on themselves and then began to pray for others with a similar problem and that individual was, was healed. I know of several cases along that line. And also one individual who was praying that he might be healed, but he finally pictured the beating body of his own mind of the stripes of Christ, the flagellations, the torn flesh, the blood, and the pain and the agony that Christ suffered. And when he realized his own sufferings, as it says in is it, uh, 1 Peter 4, rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That's hard to do when you're in pain. But when you're in your pain, you are thinking, I am a partaker of Christ's sufferings. And the apostle Peter says, rejoice in that truth. But James tells us here, pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And he tells the story of Elijah saying, look, Elijah was a human being just like you, just like me. And he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. 
So James is telling us, pray one for another that you may be healed. And as uh, Elijah was just a human being, so are you human beings. God will hear your prayer, and he, he'll, he will respond. We have prayer requests often in our church bulletin or announced here from the pulpit. As I mentioned before, I normally have in my little week at a glance a listing of I did have 75 names the last time I checked, and it's always changing, and some die, and some are added to it. Uh, but I hope that you have your own prayer list, and you're praying. Of course, some people you pray for because they're a part of your heart, and your memory, and your emotions, and you're praying from every day, and you don't need a list. But sometimes we forget about various people scattered all over the world. And I know I might forget, but I have to go back to my list every once in a while and realize, oh, there's someone, you know, over there in the Philippines or someone there in South Africa that needs, needs our prayers. So pray one for another. And, of course, part of that is forgiveness, which we discussed during the uh, Days of Unleavened Bread and preparation for Passover. So point number one is pray for one another. Let's turn to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians 6, you all know as the armor of God. But one point we look at, there are six elements to the armor of God. Verse 17 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, I just, uh, I have to interject here. Uh, while we were there in, in Houston, we uh, went to visit some antebellum homes, some historic homes. And one of the places had a... Uh, uh, a shop with uh, swords and guns. And this man was an antique uh, collector. And uh, he said, there are the swords made by Ames. Oh, really? It was Ames Sword Company. So I uh, think of this, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The, the, the sword of the Spirit is God's Word, which is more important. By the way, uh, Ames also made plows, not just swords. And that's in Massachusetts, by the way. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. In verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So we have six elements of the armor, but then he says go on and pray with perseverance for all the saints. Pray for one another. That transitions into point number two, pray for the ministry. Because Paul goes on to say in verse 19 of Ephesians 6, and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And I know that many of you are doing that. You're praying for the open doors for the gospel to go out, whether through television, printing, or the internet, or through public appearances the TWPs as we call them now, Tomorrow's World Presentations. So pray, as the Apostle Paul said, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So pray for the ministry. We have uh, in our church bulletin quite a list, and here in Charlotte we have quite a collection uh, of organized uh, ministry. Uh, on the back of your church bulletin, we have listed the ministers, the deacons, the deaconesses. And so if you don't know all the ministers in the local area, uh, use the church bulletin. Pray for your ministers. And of course, as we go out to other church areas, we encourage the brethren in those areas to pray for their regional directors, um, their uh, area uh, pastors, and uh, I know that you don't know all of the ministers around the world, and we hope to by next year sometime, uh, maybe before next year, have another photo album of the ministry. It's very helpful in praying for them around the world. But I'll just mention a few. In Belgium, we have Mr. Reese Ellis. In Argentina, Mr. Aaron Bravo. Mr. Wakefield can comment on that. He knows him well. In Costa Rica, you know Mr. George Schaubeck. And you know his son uh, was stabbed, and so we prayed for the Shawbeck family in Costa Rica. Indonesia, we have Arya Nusantara. In Kenya, Mr. Simon Muthama. In Malaysia, Mr. Rajan Moses. I'm not mentioning them all, but just a 
uh, sampling here. In Trinidad, we've heard about Mr. Fitzroy Agreement and the announcements. Regional directors, Rod King, Gerald Weston, Bruce Tyler, and then regional pastors here in the United States. We have Mr. Dan Hall, Mr. Lambert Greer, Mr. Rand Millich, and Dr. Jeff Fall. So we need to be praying for the ministry, and I hope you do that daily. Number one was pray for one another. Number two, pray for the ministry. Number three, fulfill your own personal responsibility. What do I mean by that? 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Well, oftentimes we judge others, and particularly between husbands and wives, well, you're not fulfilling your, your responsibility, wife. And so the husband is focusing on his wife's responsibility rather than on his own, when he should be focusing on his own responsibility. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, we saw in verse 12 before, the body is one and as many members. But all, that, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so all is Christ. Verse 15, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? We shouldn't be comparing ourselves among ourselves. Of course, Christ warns us not to do that. If the whole body were an eye, verse 17, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now, verse 18 is uh, difficult for people who have the sin of self-ambition, selfish ambition. They won't take the responsibilities at hand that they know they should fulfill. They get too selfish in their ambition. We've had ministers who were disappointed because uh, one man and three continents away wasn't appointed a replacement of the regional director and left the church. You, know, you just have to shake your head. What was this man's thinking? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And even John the Baptist said, I must decrease while he increases. And Dr. Meredith has told you the stories of his exiles and his uh, demotions, as you will, temporarily for a period of time. But you have to trust Christ that he's going to work things out in his way and in his time. Verse 19, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor can the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And I was just thinking during the song service, just looking over at some of our widows and realizing how important, how vital each member of the body is. Whether it's a one-year-old baby or an 89-year-old widow, everyone is important in the body of Christ. Verse 22, no much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And you remember the story of Anna the prophetess in Luke, the second chapter. She's up in her widow of 80 years, and what did she do? She served God. How? With prayers and fastings. She was an important part of the preparation of that coming out of Christ when he came to the temple as a baby. So everyone is important. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, verse 23, on these we bestow greater honor. But our presentable parts, verse 24, have no need. But God composed the body, having greater honor to that part which it lacks. So are you an ear or are you an eye? I had the privilege of knowing my grandfather, William Ames. He was an inventor. He was, uh, worked with machinery. And in fact, I, as I recall, he had the ends of four fingers cut off, two on each hand, because he was working with machinery and he was a, an inventor. But he still was able to work with those hands. When you think about the marvelous design that, of the human hand, what it can do, that it uh, builds great skyscrapers, of course, using tools to do so, but uh, performing musical instruments, pianos and trumpets and harps and violins to produce soul-inspiring music. 
but the hand can do nothing apart from the body. Its life is supported by the circulatory system and by the nervous system and by the commands of the, the brain and the mind. But each of us is a body of member of the body of Christ. We may be an ear, we may be a, uh, an eye, or we might be an elbow. In the spring of 1963, the Ambassador Corral performed Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, The Mikado. That was in the San Gabriel Auditorium. I played the part of Poobah. Hey, Poobah was the first Lord of the Treasury, Lord Chief Justice, Commander in Chief, Lord High Admiral, Archbishop of Titipu, and Lord Mayor, and Lord High Everything Else. And he was going to be executed, but uh, Kadishaw uh, was going to intercede for him. And I remember my only line I remember in that was when I'm, I'm pleading with the Mikado, the great dictator for my life, I just said, mercy for Puba, mercy for Puba. That really translated into many times in my life when I've asked God for mercy to come boldly before his throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. And he says to come boldly to do that. Well, I'll just share a part of that with you. Kadisha was not the most beautiful woman. She says, you hold that I am not beautiful because my face is plain, but you know nothing. You are still enlightened, she says to me. Learn then that it is not the face alone that is beauty is to be sought. My face is unattractive. And I say, it is. I agree with her. And Kadisha says, but I have a left shoulder blade that is a miracle of loveliness. People come miles to see it. My right elbow has a fascination that few can resist. In fact, people come miles to see that on view Tuesdays and Fridays on presentation of a visiting card. I kid my wife every once in a while. I say, honey, you got a beautiful elbow. But you might turn to 1 Peter, the third chapter, 1 Peter 3. And I think all of us know of beautiful women in the church, beautiful character. And I know one lady that I've talked about over the years who had 11 children and had teeth missing, and yet she had beauty on the inward part. As it says in 1 Peter, the third chapter, and... Um, Verse 1, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Well, obviously, you must put on apparel. Rather, the emphasis must be on the hidden person of the heart, verse 4 with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And so how many times have I seen women who are not so beautiful on the outside, but had that beautiful character on the inside? And that's what God is doing. He's creating that masterpiece of his creation, beautiful, righteous character. But we're talking about fulfilling our own personal responsibilities. Turn back to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I, when we're driving in the car, I kind of, my wife reads to me in the Bible, and every once in a while I'll ask her a question, and I give her a test of scripture, and I say, well, honey, uh, what does Ephesians 5.22 say? Well, she got it right. Wives, submit to your own husbands. That's the Lord. <laughs> so anyway, we have some fun in the car. But he goes on to say in verse 25, Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This is not a suggestion. And as we review in some cases, Dr. Winnell, Mr. League, and myself under Dr. Meredith's direction, review divorce and remarriage cases to see where someone might be biblically bound or not bound because of fraud or pornea. And we find time and time again, the man might say, I don't love you. What do you mean you don't love her? It's a command. It's not a suggestion. You may not have a certain kind of likability, personality, affection, but God gives us a command 
Husbands, love your wives. There's no other option. If you're converted, if you say, I, I, can't, I can't love my wife, you're not converted. Because God says, for, I'll give you the example there in First, uh, was it John 15, uh, where he says, I give you a command to love one another as I have loved you. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And so if we are going to be members of the body of Christ, we need to fulfill our own personal responsibility. In years past, we had husbands that were so aggressive and even so harsh because they wanted to make sure that his, his wife or their wives were fulfilling their responsibility and he himself was not re fulfilling his own responsibility. So I have to look at myself and say, what are my husbandly responsibilities before God? I can spend all my time trying to make my wife fulfill her responsibilities and still lose my salvation because I'm disobeying Christ. We all must fulfill our own personal responsibilities as members of Christ's body. And I might just mention that uh, the May-June Living Church News, I think uh, we just got ours in the mail the other day. Um, the uh, editorial is here by Dr. Roderick Meredith, What Every Husband Needs to Know. So I hope you, all of you husbands will read that article. I've been preaching that. That helped me from the first time it came out in 1966 and uh, till now, uh, 47 years ago. I've been striving to live by those principles. What all husbands need to know, love and respect, support and encouragement, help and protection, leadership and guidance, inspiration to grow, those five areas I pray about frequently that I can fulfill as a husband towards my wife. So make sure you read that, that article, May, June 2013, LCN, uh, What Every Husband Should Know. But now let's turn to Titus in case the women uh, think that uh, they don't need to love their husbands. I know, in fact, uh, uh, one counseling with a couple that uh, Ambassador College, uh, that was around the liberal years, uh, 74, and uh, the, the girl said, I didn't want to, she read the uh, wedding ceremony and said, you know, to submit to your husband. Well, I don't want that in the wedding ceremony. And where does it say anyway in the Bible that women have to love their husbands? Well, it says so right here. And uh, Titus, what is the responsibility for the older women? Titus 2, Verse 1, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith and love, and patient. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. And also to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. Uh-oh, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So that's directed to the women men, not to the men. You don't force your wife to be obedient, but you fulfill your own loving responsibilities. So number three, as members of the body of Christ, to be active and growing and healthy spiritually, Fulfill your personal responsibility as members of Christ's body. Number four, don't isolate yourself from the body. Turn to Proverbs, the 18th chapter. And oh, how have we seen this over the past decades with the splits in the churches and uh, with individuals going off to start another church by themselves. Proverbs 18 and verse 1. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Or as the NASU uh, st states it, he who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. So you don't want to be in that category. And uh, I know of some friends, colleagues, evangelists, ministers who isolated themselves and they did not get wise counsel. They began to go off base. They went off the trunk of the tree into the twigs and actually got lost. Why? Because they 
argued against all wise judgment. They didn't seek counsel. In fact, uh, you know, the Living Church News uh, article here uh, by Dr. Meredith is our Council of Elders, its purpose and activity, March, April, 2013. And Dr. Meredith seeks counsel, and I've seen him change some ideas from time to time because he considered the counsel of many of the members on the Council of Elders, and of course he has his own mini council that he calls it with our executive luncheons almost weekly now, and he seeks advice, he seeks counsel. Don't isolate yourself from the body as we see people going way off base and they don't keep the, the commandments or they start up with some new weird doctrine or emphasize a minor doctrine that isn't really important, that, that important for salvation. But we need to seek counsel within the church. Let's turn to Proverbs while we're in the book of Proverbs, just take a look at of, of those uh, wise counsels. You know that, Proverbs 11, verse 14, Proverbs 11 and verse 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 15, verse 22. Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. With the ministry in the church, with the deacons, with the elders, with our exhorting one another while it is called today as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can stay on the track, on the right path, towards God's kingdom. You know, there used to reminds me when Mr. Herbert Armstrong was uh, getting the church, he called it back on the track. There was a restaurant there in Pasadena just uh, across the tracks from uh, the uh, Ambassador campus, and it was called the Loose Caboose. And symbolically, after Mr. Armstrong got the uh, church back on the track around the uh, beginning of the early 80s, it was changed to the right track. So the loose caboose was changed name to the right track. And it just uh, seemed to fit in just with the timing of what Mr. Armstrong was doing with the church. Proverbs 24 and verse 6. Proverbs 24, verse 6. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. Well, you don't want to be an individual Christian or an independent Christian. Mr. Armstrong wrote in The Mystery of the Ages about individual Christians, page 270. He said, now, what about the private or individual Christian who says, I don't want to be a part of the church. I want to seek my salvation direct and alone with Christ. The answer is this. God himself laid out the plan and the method by which humans may be, after begettal, trained and prepared to become part of the divine personnel of born God beings that shall form the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will be the God family, a superbly and highly trained and organized family of God beings. The church is God's special school. The church is God's special school for training those he has selected and called to be trained in his church, to be kings and priests, to rule and to teach for their part in that kingdom. Only those so trained in the church will be kings and priests in the kingdom of God. The person who says, I will get my salvation alone outside of the church is totally deceived. We heard about self-deception in the sermonette. I won't go into that, but uh, just to give you a reference, on page 228, Mystery of the Ages, uh, Mr. Armstrong has a section on church, a teacher's college. And one of the mandates he gave when he was alive was learn to teach, because kings and priests will be teachers in part. So number three then, or number four, whichever one I'm on, number four, don't isolate yourself from the body. As we read in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, we're one bread, one body, but we need to have a teachable attitude, not a critical attitude. Don't isolate yourself from the body, number four. Number five, which he emphasized during the Passover season, deeply appreciate the head of the body. We read that, so you don't need to turn it already, but Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives 
just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. We should have meditated on that before the Passover and realized just the sufferings, the dedication, the sacrifice that Christ gave. And even in Galatians 2.20 where the Apostle Paul says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So think of your Savior. Appreciate the head of the body and stand in awe of his name. And his name has to do with his character, his authority, his office. So turn to Philippians 2 and verse 9. Philippians 2 and verse 9. No, we need to reverence and stand in fear, godly fear, of the authority in the name of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 9. It gives the background how he humbled himself even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, verse 8. Then verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And if you're not praying on your knees, of course some of you may have arthritis and we know of those exceptions, but every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means master, owner, boss, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So stand in awe of his name. And you know Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. That is the only name. Of course, the world has misused that name and comes up with false Christs. That's why Dr. Meredith wrote that one of our missions is to feed the church of God, and to teach the true name of Jesus because there are those who misuse that name. But as we read during the Passover, John 14, John 16, well, John 15 and John 16, three times, and Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, or the Father will do it. So you have the authority to come boldly before the throne of God. You know, when he died, the, the veil of the temple was rent in two, giving us access to the very holy of holies, the very throne of God. And we can come boldly, should come boldly before the throne of God. As I mentioned, that's James 4, verse 16, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. I won't turn there, but Proverbs 18, 10, one of my... Uh, favorite scriptures, among hundreds of favorite scriptures. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. So Christ is our living, loving Savior. He is in the process of saving us even now. now let's, we've read it before, but let's take a look at Revelation 1 and verse 6. We're being renewed day by day, as it tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16. But we need to appreciate the head who is our living, loving Savior. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. Revelation 1, verse 5. Well, we might have start with verse 4. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. That's how we're born into God's kingdom. And the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So we think of God's sacrifice. We think of Christ's sacrifice. And deeply appreciate the head of the body Number five, thank him for his love, for his sacrifice, and for his mercy. Number six is carefully follow Christ's leadership. If you really appreciate what he's done for you, then you're going to follow him. You're going to obey him. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, his church is organized. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of the grave will not prevail against it. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. 
Here he gives us uh, organization within the church. Ephesians 4, starting with verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Forgotten about all this wonderful tea. Mm. Thank you. Ephesians 4, 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up, the strengthening of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith. You know, if you've got scattered ministers all over the place, scattered church of God groups preaching different things, how can they come into the unity of the faith? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Dr. Meredith gave an inspiring sermon on the, full, on the stature of Christ, and if you've not heard that, you might want to go to our church library and uh, listen to that. Verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, even Christ. Now he goes on to say then, Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, you may be a joint, an elbow, or a knee, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. You might want to underline that phrase, every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we are joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. We work together as a body, as a team. We follow the head. We follow the leader because we have a mission. And the church is busy with that mission. You've heard the fruits of the mission during 2012 in which we had 360 individuals were baptized in 2012. And we have a new French Tomorrow's World magazine and a Spanish Tomorrow's World magazine. We had 4,500 visitors during the Tomorrow's World presentations last year in 18 different countries. Just amazing. Uh, you heard them before, but I'll mention them again. Australia, Barbados, Canada, Dominican Republic, Ethiopia, France, Haiti, Jamaica, Kenya, Malaysia, Nigeria, New Zealand, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, and the United Kingdom and the United States. So we are out there in the cities, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And it's so encouraging, as I said, when we meet people as we go to the outlying churches for those who come in through those special presentations. And you realize that our Tomorrow's World magazine has now had a print run of 430,000. But we thank God for the growth that he's giving us as we all work together as a team, as a body to fulfill that mission. Let's turn to John, the 10th chapter. John 10, here is again that principle that we've emphasized, I've emphasized, and other ministers have from time to time, when Jesus said in verse 27, John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We have people who are not following Christ. They're self-appointed critics, and they're not really following Christ. How do we follow the voice of Christ. Well, we follow his ministry and his organization. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.10, follow me as I follow Christ. Or in the New King James, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he tells his ministers to preach the word. I've paraphrased that earlier in the sermon, but let's turn to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, 2 Timothy 4. And I know this is a little hard to take because Americans are independent. There's a certain kind of resourcefulness that we all should have, but we all are responsible and responsive to the head of the body, which is Christ. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter and verse 1. I charge you, therefore, Paul writes to Timothy, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And sometimes if 
one of us, Dr. Meredith or Dr. Warnale or I, rebuke the congregation, are you going to take it? And you realize, wait a minute, I need to change. I need to listen. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, Jesus said. Yes, with all long-suffering and teaching. And I'm amazed at really the kind of long-suffering Dr. Meredith has administratively in many situations. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So we need to consider the shepherd and follow his voice and follow him. He is, of course, the Lamb of God, and we had an article in the March-April 2013 Living Church News, Worthy is the Lamb. I hope you read that article. But consider Christ as our shepherd as well. He keeps us. Uh, let's turn to Psalm 121. I hope I'm, oh, I'm running out of time here. I was hoping to go for another hour, but I'll try to cut back. Psalm 121. Psalm 121, verse 1. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. Remember Mr. Weston kidding us that time when he wanted to convince us not to go to Myrtle Beach, but to go to a mountain resort in Canada. He says, Mr. Weston said, it does not say, I will lift up mine eyes to the beach. So he said, uh, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. Well, it comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He that keeps you will not slumber. Behold, who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Maybe that's a new concept to you. But a shepherd is one who looks after the sheep, and Christ is our keeper. He takes care of us. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the noon by night, the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I was locked out of my apartment one time there in Virginia Beach, and I remembered this father. I said, well, Father, you promised to bless my going out and my coming in, and I can't get in. I don't have the key. And I remember the landlady, there was a, a basement there, that you could get into where the furnace was, and I was able to go up to where the door was and put a card and flip a lock so I could get back into my apartment. So God helped me to get back in. He preserved my going out and my coming back in after I claimed this promise. But let's turn to Numbers, the sixth chapter, number six. This is the famous Aaronic blessing, that is the blessing of Aaron in Numbers, the sixth chapter. Numbers six and verse 22, number 6 and verse 22. The Lord bless you and keep you. Yes, the Lord is your keeper, we just read in Psalm 121, verse 5. Numbers 6, verse 24, the eternal bless you and keep you. The eternal make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The eternal lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This was the blessing that Aaron gave to the children of Israel. So God is our keeper. We have to look unto our Savior. We need to hear his voice. We need to follow his lead. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, Hebrews 12, one we've read frequently. Therefore, Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that is the men and women of faith in chapter 11. Let us lay aside every weight, and we are weighted down by the distractions of this world and the sin which does so easily ensnare us. And we learn the lessons through the days of unleavened bread, how to overcome sin. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How do we do that? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So number five, number six, that is, is to look to Christ as our leader. Number seven, remember your spiritual identity. Who are you? Well, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, I will be a father to you 
and you will be my sons and daughters. We're members of his family. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16 tells us, you are the temple of the living God. And you know 2 Corinthians 6, I believe it is, 19 and 20, that you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. You are the temple of the living God. Why? Because God's spirit dwells in you. So who are you? You know, Jesus never forgot who he was. 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are ambassadors for Christ. And then Matthew 5, let's turn there, Matthew 5. Know who are you? There are many descriptions of true Christians. I've challenged you before, and I'll challenge you again. I did in Houston this time, and one woman uh, had an excellent, a day later after the sermon, uh, gave a long list of our descriptor, description from A to Z. You know, A, you're ambassadors for Christ. B, you're God's building. C, you're Christians. D, you're disciples of Christ. So I'll challenge you to make a whole list from A to Z of who you are. Here we find out what we are as well. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, and uh, starting here with verse, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So let your, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So how bright is your light? How salt, how salty is your salt? The May, June 2013 Living Church News, which you just got in the mail the last couple of days, I presume for most of you, Dr. Meredith has are you a positive person on the cover? He writes, we must use the awesome power of the Holy Spirit to get rid of what the Apostle Paul called the spirit of fear. For God's spirit gives us power and love and a sound mind. We must train ourselves to banish negative thoughts and we must emphasize the positive. And then he just gives quotes from none of these diseases. So are you a positive person? You know, there was a book written by Norman Cousins years ago. He was, um, he was, uh, the, had cancer, and uh, I just happened to go through the Living Church Library, pick a book off the shelf, and open it up to page 266 of Facts and uh, Fallacies by Reader's Digest, uh, 1988. And uh, it gives an article about uh, Norman Cousins in 1964, who was struck down by a seemingly irreversible disease. The connective tissue between his bones was degenerating rapidly. Within a week of the appearance of the first symptoms, he was lying in the hospital, unable to move his limbs, and in terrible pain. Sleep was impossible. Well, he thought that this came about from negative emotions, that he was under a great deal of stress. So he decided that if negative emotions could be harmful to the health, maybe positive emotions would, would help. Laughter, he decided, was the best medicine, and Cousins started to watch classic episodes of the television program Candid Camera. I made the joyous discovery, he wrote later, that 10 minutes of genuine belly laughter would give me at least two hours of pain-free sleep. Well, he kept this up about a positive attitude. Of course, God is the healer. We know that. But he also wants us to think positively, as we know in Philippians 4 and verse 8. To think of those things that are true, lovely, honest, just, pure, lovely of a good report, if there be any praise to think on these things. The article concludes, Cousins is convinced that his refusal to give in, coupled with his regimen of laughter, was critical to his recovery. Eight days after his move from the hospital, the pain had gone from one thumb and he was sleeping well. Three weeks later, he was jogging on a Puerto Rican beach and the tissue in his spi spine and joints was beginning to renew itself. Within a few months, he returned to work. So who are you? Are you a positive person? We are ambassadors for Christ. We're the branches of the vine. Christ said, I am the vine. You are the branches. We're Christ's body. But we know that he is a loving, loving head of that body. Some years ago, I had the assignment of writing who I was. 
In fact, it was a Good News Magazine article some years ago that suggested we examine ourselves and write an, a, an essay entitled What I Am. I've shared with this, this with you before, and I'll share a little of it. This was back, uh, oh, about 25 years ago, an essay I wrote, What I Am. So I'm sharing something personal here. I am God's begotten son and servant and younger brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are no other gods in the universe who are the kingdom of God, the family of God. Uh, skip that paragraph. I am baptized into the body of Christ by God's spirit. I need to pray more, do more for his body, his family, in promoting our being knit together in love, Romans 5.5. 5. Skip that paragraph, skip that paragraph, skip that paragraph. The more personal things <clears throat> that I needed to change. I am also a husband of the most beautiful wife on earth who has given great insight and wisdom as led by the Holy Spirit. I need to set a better example in love, family activity, and home management. I need to attack my weaknesses more zealously and win more victories through Jesus Christ our Lord, 1 Corinthians 15. Through the Passover and the blood of Jesus Christ, I can now see myself more clearly. I can be forgiven of my sins, my past, my lack of doing good works and righteousness. Thank God, through Christ, I can do all things, Philippians 4.13, and be conformed to his image. As I cooperate, submit, contribute to God's family, God will bless the work of his church even more abundantly. So I would challenge all of you to write an article, if you haven't, sometime in your life, an essay on what I am or who I am. We have the awesome privilege of being members of the body of Christ. By one spirit, we've been baptized into one body. We're members of that body. We are training as kings and priests. We're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness above all else. We're striving to be Philadelphian Christians, as we heard in Dr. Douglas Winnale's commentary. We must be spiritually healthy members of that body. We must be active members of that body. Philadelphia, not Laodicean. We must be responsive, cooperative members of his body as a team works in a cooperative manner. We must be supportive members of the body. And we must be committed members of the body. How committed are you? Several passengers of U.S. Air Flight 1549 feared death within a few minutes. What would be your last thoughts if you had only five minutes to live? What are your thoughts right now? Are you totally surrendered? Are you totally in God's hands? What were the last thoughts of the martyr Stephen? I'll read it. You don't need to turn there. Acts 7, 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. But when he had said this, he fell asleep. Those were the last thoughts and words of Stephen as before he died. And then, of course, Jesus himself on the cross had what was called the last seven statements or sayings. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am thirsty. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let's turn to Romans, the 14th chapter. Romans 14. What will be your last thoughts? What are your thoughts now? Romans, the 14th chapter, we have to be totally in God's hands at all times. That is, we are totally surrendered to him. We're totally yielded to him. We want to do his will and not our own. Romans 14, verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. That should be a conscious thought in your mind. 
For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. If you truly surrendered yourself to God, you will have contentment and peace of mind. God tells us to number our days. He instructs us to redeem the time. How can we grow in greater spiritual health as members of that body? I gave you seven keys. Number one, pray for one another. Number two, pray for the ministry. Number three, fulfill your or your own personal responsibility. Four, don't isolate yourself from the body. Five, appreciate the head of the body. Six, carefully follow Christ's leadership. And number seven, remember your own spiritual identity. We are members of Christ's body and have a major responsibility to fulfill the mission he's given us. As we read in Ephesians 5, verse 30, we are members of his body. So brethren, let's care for one another. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're members of the family of God, the royal priesthood, the holy nation. Let's rejoice as God's family and let's care for one another. Most importantly, let's respond to the head of the church our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And remember the last words of the Bible. You might turn there to Revelation 21, 22. Remember the last words. They were the last written thoughts of the Apostle John. What were they? The revelator, Jesus Christ, proclaims in Revelation 22, verse 20, Surely I am coming quickly. The Apostle John's last written thoughts and words Revelation 22, verse 20. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, brethren, let's go forward with the love and the knowledge and the grace of Christ. Let's be supportive, active, cooperative, obedient, loving members of his body.